Hello and welcome to episode 50-something of the Mental Health Gaming Podcast. Once again, I am Bradley. I'm joined by my faithful companion dog, Stu. And also, later on, special guest, Bill Gates. We'll talk to Bill a bit later, but how are you doing, Stu? Not bad, not bad. I'm not, you know, I'm not sure about being compared to a seeing eye dog, but at least they have some sort of function and a job, neither of which I have at the moment. So I suppose it's actually a compliment. Well, my my other um, choices of seeing eye dog so far have not been as successful. So, you know, you're you're well in with a shout for that. Ah, were they family members? Because those can always be a disappointment. (laughs) Yes. Yes, they were. (laughs) Um, And we'll we'll come to sort of like my my eye journey. Uh, a little bit later. Um, you're looking forward to talking to Bill Gates later as well? Oh, yeah, that'll be fascinating. Yeah, he seems like a really charismatic and exciting fellow. So well, he's, yeah. he's he's joining us on the podcast, so nice. that's something to say and listen to. It's going to be you with a really poor impression, isn't it? No, no. I'm not going to pretend to be Bill Gates. I don't need to pretend to be Bill Gates because Bill Gates is with us. Oh, okay, right. But anyway, video games, I've clearly not been playing anything. Uh, my daughter's only been playing some uh, Super Mario 3D World um, and not got any further. Um, so it's on you, Stu. Tell me about these mystical video games that people play these days. Oh, well. I deliberately played a game for the podcast because I was like, oh, yeah, I'm playing loads of stuff that I've just been talking about for weeks, so I'll play something else. And there was a free copy of Rage 2 going from the Epic Store. Mm. So I was like, yeah, well, I'll give that a go for free. I mean, interesting sort of side note. I don't know. You decide whether it's interesting or not. But freedom is very much, and, you know, whether things are free, is very much based on time for me. And because it is like an over 50 gig install, that to me, it, it's like, because it's taking up so much space, it's the almost like... Currency. Yeah, yeah. You, you know, you're kind of paying for it. You're paying for it in terms of having to fit it on an SSD. So anyway, and the amount of time it took to download. So I went through all, you know, I was like, oh yeah, okay, well, I'll give it a go. And um, I really wish I hadn't because it's just, it's the most aggressively mediocre game that I've played in a very, very long time. So it kind of looks like the first one, but not as good. And the first one didn't look amazing, but it looked unique because of that mega texture thing it was doing. Yeah. Like a lot of people, I was like, yeah, it's not brilliant, this game. And I didn't really play it very much, but I was impressed with what they were doing. Yeah, visually, technical level. The, the first the first Rage was, it struck me as, I'd have been happy with just a demo of that game. Yeah, yeah. It looks nice. The first hour was fun enough, and then you'd done it all. Yeah. It's almost as if, Sometimes, yeah, they, they build all the assets and they're like, look what we've done technically. Oh, buggeration, now we've got to put a game in there. Yeah. And that definitely felt like that with Rage. And it feels even more like that with Rage 2, astonishingly. Because it's basically Destiny. Uh, it's just Destiny. Like I could, I could try and say some more clever stuff, but it's just Destiny. It's just like a pale imitation of a game that's been out for a very long time. Um so yeah you're just wandering around and you're doing all these things and they're all basically point to point quests with mediocre weapons you've seen a billion times and pick up abilities that you've had a billion times before and there's nothing wrong with it per se but it is so dull it's the most I was like my brain was totally switching off playing it like shutting down because it was that bland yeah and for something to spend that much money and just rip off another game and it be so aggressively bland and boring is stunning it's terrible the the problem with rage 2 was the marketing as well because i remember when they first revealed it and the marketing behind it there was like bright colours and it was like this punk style thing and it was like oh it's ott whatever we got wrong with rage We've, we've done away with that. It's exciting. And I oh, look at all this aesthetic to it. And yeah, then I saw like initial reports of it and I was very tempted to pre-order. And then I saw the initial reports come out and I was like, it looks a bit bland, actually. It seems to lack the excitement. 
Um, because I first thought, oh, they're going to go for a bullet storm, but in an open world setting, I'm all for that. I'm all for open world bullet storm. But yeah, no, it looked bland, um, which was a shame. And the marketing yeah. went completely the other way with it. Yeah. And the in fact, this is a good point, because the only interesting thing to say about the game is how target focused it is politically because basically what you're doing is you're going around the landscape and you're killing punks trying to establish a new system of control so it's kind of like on the surface of it it's like oh yeah you know you're in this post-apocalyptic wasteland and yeah getting mad max vibes and all this but in reality what you're trying to do is turn everything into the most prescribed sensible and mm. <laughs> boring society that you possibly can you're an agent of control uh yeah. just k- killing people who are doing their own thing <laughs> it's really dodgy and it, it doesn't make any commentary on that it just lets no, you do it that's the thing with i think with most post-apocalyptic i think films and games especially anyone who's lived in the wilderness like the actual post-apocalypse and they've lived they've lived that and their minds have gone or whatever or they've had to become scavengers or really feral because that's the life they've they're always treated as the bad guys and they're the ones who need to be eradicated it's always the same without going on the nuance of actually why are these people like this why is their life gone like that it's actually a class war system and it's but it's a propagandaish. It always has been post-apocalyptic. It's propagandaish yeah. of I oh know these are the bad people because look at them. They're different. They're poor. They're scavengers. We're not. We've managed to survive in in like ivory tower or in the bunkers. Um, Fallout does the same. But what I felt Fallout Three did really well was one of the side missions you had to do, where you were sent to go and kill the ghouls. Uh, but you go there and you get to know the ghouls. You actually find out they're living peacefully and they've set up a community and stuff like that and they've managed to work it out. I thought that was a very interesting... They didn't go deep enough into what that world could have been um, and it was still became very binary. But I think that's the closest I've seen in a post-apocalyptic game where they actually address that class, um, class warfare issue. Yeah. Yes, uh, I, I think... I, it would probably be something that we'd encounter in The Last of Us 2 if either of us played it as well. <laughs> because in the first game, obviously, it's from the perspective of two survivors. And then, apparently, in the second one, it, it sort of flips the perspective a little bit so you can get to see it from both sides and see that you're equally victim and villain. And, mm. you, yeah, there is absolutely zero nuance whatsoever in Rage 2. But, I mean... Yeah, I mean, even sort of politics aside, it's it's just not a good game. It's just a, a completely bland, by-the-numbers exercise. And for something that, like you said, is styled to be, or initially was, and marketed to be, you know, out there and a bit weird and a bit kind of anarchic, it's, it's the mirror opposite of that. <laughs> and if you want to play a game that is open-world and does have that anarchic feel to it and does go over the top... I, I recommend Sunset Overdrive um, for anyone who's never played that. No, I've that never is played an outstanding, it. Outstanding, yeah. outstanding. Right, I say outstanding. It's fun. Um, I've never completed it, which I suppose isn't the best of endorsements. But honestly, <laughs> the time I have with that was just so so fun. Some of the mechanics do get a bit tired towards the end, and it has a um, a tower defense section that you have to do every now and again. Uh, but overall, it works really well, and it but it sticks to its convictions. It's got a story to tell, which has got some serious undertones, but uses the comedy um, and the punk and the over the top nature well. Uh, that's how to do it. Wasn't perfect, but compared to Rage and Rage Two, um, yeah, it's nigh on perfect. So give that a go if you haven't. I will do. I will do. Uh, it reminded me when you were speaking that um, I think. No More Heroes is probably the only thing I've played that sort of properly defines that anarchic thing, you know, that that feeling. uh, Maybe probably only in an action game, but I really don't play very much other than action games. And if you ever want a blueprint on how to to create an open world that feels different with all all the different games and 
to make fetch quests in a way or and that work just look at the yakuza series as that's grown uh they all take place pretty much within like the same environment but every game feels different and they change up the mechanics within that world as like yakuza 7 with its turn-based persona style stuff works really really well so right. you know you haven't always just because you've stuck to a certain genre or you've got a certain world you haven't got to stick to doing it by the numbers you can try different things even if it doesn't work so there you go i could be a video game developer if i had talent <laughs> yeah i think you know what's missing from a lot of these studios is the big studios particularly they don't seem to have any outsider concepts not many anyway you know it's and it's not i don't think it's the studio's fault we know yeah, you know that, yeah, that publishers, from above yeah, unfortunately yeah. yeah 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 no absolutely yeah anything else you've been playing yeah yeah i got and, and this wasn't just for the podcast but i bought and downloaded and played as tends to be the case with games um natsuki chronicles now that's a a shoot 'em up a horizontal shoot 'em up in the set in the same universe as uh, Ginga Force, which always makes me laugh. You can't ever say that, you know, with with a straight face. It's just not possible. Um, Especially when I've got one of those that's yeah. currently in preschool. Yeah, that's right. And for any <laughs> non-UK residents, Ginga is a, a corruption of ginger, and just you know, used as an insult. So it's not very nice. But yeah, Ginga Force. Still, I'm afraid, funny. Anyway, Natsuki Chronicles. So. It's really um, very much in that same visual style and in the style of sort of G-Rev who did Border Down and Zero Gunner 2, I believe they did as well. So it's very sort of clean lines and very simple Fisher-Pricey, boxy looking, uh, very bright and clean. It doesn't go for that 80s or 90s aesthetic for shooters, which is very much based on, uh, you know, that... Um, well, again, sort of slightly post-apocalyptic, but very cyberpunky, gritty kind of look. It's very completely the opposite. And gameplay-wise, it's got some really great stuff in it. So, just very briefly, you have you can buy weapons. It's got a story mode and an arcade mode. The arcade mode has all of the potential weapons dotted about. You pick them up like you would in a normal game like that. But it also has a story mode where it's currency. You, you gain currency from doing ta- you know missions and replaying them and doing better and getting better in the ranking and then you know looking and uh, what's it called developing weapons and then using them. And it's great because you can choose a loadout that suits you and then you can improve that loadout by enhancing weapons. But that makes it sound very heavy, but it's not. It's just very quick sort of system easy tier system it's not like a they've chucked in an rpg mode no not at all it's, it's very straightforward but yeah the, the core gameplay is fantastic it's got lots of training wheels that you can turn on and off like you would in a in a drive modern driving game so you can have like bullet trails uh or you can have icons that show where the enemies are going to come from and you can have those switched on or off and all sorts of other uh quality of life things but it's also really tough but it, you can unlock easier modes and then playing through them still gives you stuff. So there's a value to everything that you do rather than it just being, oh, you've got to be amazing, you know, get good. It's not just that. Yeah, I mean, it's the best horizontal shooter I've played for a couple of years, I would say, and uh, very happy with it. It's, um, I've, again, it's one of those genres I've never really, I don't want to say I've never taken to because I've always played uh, the odd one here or there and i've probably played the bigger titles like your r types your defenders um and things like that and darius burst as well i, I enjoyed that one but my favorite one i played simora on the um or cinemora simora help me pronunciation yeah i think it's cinemora yeah cinemora there we go i played that on the um on the playstation vita um, and Resogun as well, like Resogun, if that counts. I don't know if that counts, but anyway. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, good, it does. But what I've always found with the more niche ones, um, when I've given them a go, is is the fact that they are one genre game where they go, look, we get that not everyone is amazing at these games, so make it your own and have fun. And I, I love a game that's so hardcore quote unquote is so accessible as well yeah absolutely spot on and there doesn't seem to be that 
attitude that you get with like Dark Souls players or Demon Souls players of that get good thing that you you know you just get good or you don't enjoy the game. People seem to be happy for people to enjoy shoot uh, shoot 'em up games in the way they see fit. Um, until yeah. it comes to actual competitive high score chasing, then obviously you've got to hit a certain mode with that. But yeah, I'm one of the most impenetrable but accessible genres out there still, I think. Yeah, well said. Uh, and what I think they've done well, and they've had the benefit of you know it being one of the oldest, if not the oldest, game genres, yeah. um, is that thing where, and I've noticed they do this on most titles, you, you start off with like a stock of like one credit or two credits, but you gain more credits and possibly even infinite continues the longer you play. So instead of it going... Right, here's, here's, and Natsuki Chronicles does it to a certain degree as well. So instead of going, here's infinite credits until you get good and then you can limit yourself, it goes, you're limited at the start, you, you've got to reach a certain level of quality to get through the first two, three levels. And they act as a kind of training. And then when you've reached that point by sweat and tears and blood, then it opens up and says, okay, now you can have all the credits you like because you you know the basics. And, yeah. you know, so go with it and, and go crazy sort of thing. And I think that's a really good way of doing it. And it, it kind of highlights for me not where Dark Souls goes wrong because it hasn't gone wrong. It does what it does and it's supposed to. But I think what people want is that kind of system. Like the people who aren't really into it, like me, they want a system where you start off with all of the the toughness and the sheer verticality of difficulty that it has. But the longer you play it, the more quality of life and simplicity options get opened up so that if you want to, you can then power on through to the end. So if you just as you're reaching your skill ceiling, it makes things slightly easier for you if you're not that good at them and you can still enjoy the rest of the game. And I think that they could work that in. Yeah. Um, I know a lot of people are resistant, but I genuinely don't see that that would tarnish the experience for the people who want to do it in the hardcore way. No, no, I, I, accessibility is always is always good. I, I'd say what I really like as well is it kind of... It, some of these shoot 'em up games do this thing that it's the equivalent of going to someone going, um, look, in a bit of a tough spot, can I borrow a bit of cash? And someone goes, Yeah, sure, how much do you need? Uh, uh, 50, 50, 50, 60 pounds, okay. And they're like, You sure? And you're like, uh, Is that too much? Not enough? I don't know. Um, so it's kind of that's how it feels when it gives you the options with it. it it's yeah. doing that 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 thing to you. It's going. Kind of, it's up to you. Whatever you're comfortable with with the game, that's up to you, isn't it? Yes, which is a very clever way of doing it, really, isn't it? Because <laughs> it it does make you think. You know, it really makes you consider how much difficulty and effort you want to put yeah. in. Yeah, and you start going. Okay, look, I'm going to do it now like this, and then I'm gonna I'm gonna do it next time with these taken away to make it this bit harder. But yeah, no, I, again, I, as I said, I think the best way of describing it is impenetrable but accessible. True. Yeah, and that's it. That's it for me. Uh, other than I've been still playing that Tohu Lunar Nights, which is really great. Uh, so it, great fun. I'm still enjoying it. Just to go, I've got lined up. Um, I took a couple of the games that I offered out staff um, for reviewing because I want them um, when I'm ready. Uh, one of those is Fights in Tight Spaces. Uh, because if you thought you've seen every version of a card de- deck building game out there, well, along comes another one. And I'm looking <laughs> forward to this. It's a deck building melee fighting game. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, that looks very much like Super Hot. So, yeah, if you think you've seen it all, they still keep producing different types of deck building games. I can't report on it yet. I'll report on that hopefully in a couple of weeks. Cool. Moving on, a couple of things have happened to me this week. Um, I did, I don't think I promised last week, but I did say last week that I should be hopefully be seeing again by our next recording. That's gone completely out the window, and I'll explain about the uh, surgery um, in a minute. But I also had my COVID jab. So, who better to bring in to talk about the COVID jab than Bill Gates? Because obviously, they've injected Bill Gates into my arm 
and he now is listening to everything we say. So ah. he's now going to be a special guest on every episode. Gotcha. Or so the conspiracy theorists would have you believe. Yeah, and I had my COVID jab. And are you one of those students? You know, when you get your flu jab, do you feel the after effect, the side effects, like for the next few days? Yeah, yeah. Right. I don't. I never have, never felt after like side effects from jabs or anything like that. No, same as I've never been hungover. Um, I, I've drunk loads, like with my youth, and that I never get hungover. It's a, it's a ability. It's my superpower. It's an ability my mum passed down to me. The inability to get hungover, um, which is to the annoyance of other people. Um, but anyway, same with jabs. Don't feel any. Don't feel like the side effects. So had the COVID jab last Tuesday afternoon. Um, after we recorded, got to the evening, like about ten, eleven o'clock at night, and I felt absolutely fine. And I showed off, like, yeah, no, I feel right as rain. I had the jab, don't feel a thing. Woke up at about four, maybe five o'clock the next morning in absolute agony. Like I'd just done sort of like a round with Conor McGregor and Conor McGregor was really pissed off and attacked my knees and every single joint I had. Absolute agony, massive headache. So I took some paracetamol. Um, to try and lessen it and had to go and pick up Edith uh, about lunchtime from school and got down to the school, picked her up, got about quarter of the way home and had to sit down for five minutes because my joints were in absolute agony. Yeah. And then I've heard lots of people saying they've been like that for three, four, five, maybe even up to a week, you know, that many days. So I really can't be dealing with this. Ah, this isn't going to be good. And then felt fine by that evening. Yeah. It was my partner's birthday as well. So I was like, oh, crap. I can't. I'm going to feel like crap on her birthday as it is. You know, I've got to go for surgery the day after. So, yeah, happy birthday, Lorraine. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I felt fine by that evening. But, yeah, no, it was horrible. That 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 12 hours, everyone uh, everyone else who has had it will be going, you utter bastard, 12 hours. <laughs> um, yeah, it was horrible. I feel for anyone that suffered like that for days on end. Yeah, God. I mean, that's just a measure of the virus, isn't it? I mean, imagine having that as, you know, the the full COVID experience and being stuck with it for weeks. I mean, Jesus, it makes you really, it, well, it makes me really angry at people who are vaccine deniers, or co- oh, sorry, or COVID deniers. Like you, know. you, who's a, like you, who's a COVID denier, did you say? No, like people who are... I completely misheard that for a second. <laughs> yeah, no, it is it's all it is Bill Gates. Well, I know Bill Gates is listening, you see, so I've got to, like, pretend I'm on his side. See, I, see but this is the thing. I mean, I've, I've, I've had time on my hands, so I've heard sort of, like, many people talk about the vaccine when I've been in waiting rooms and, uh, and so on. And um, you do get people going, no, no, he is doing it. He is injected. So anyone who's had it... But I'm really fairly sure Bill Gates... The Bill Gates Foundation, the CIA, whoever, they do not care about 74-year-old Dorothy who spends all her day sitting around a care home anyway. I know. It's kind of like, what, what's your reasoning behind this? You know, what do people in that le- with that level of power, like him and Jeff Bezos, what do they not already know about us that they need to know? And how, how could they control us any more than they already do? But these are the same sort of people that if you turn around to them and went, look, the next generation of iPhone, we actually inject it under your skin, right? And what we'll do is we'll actually pay you £10 per day to have this and we'll keep upgrading it and it will do everything. So your internet will be directed straight into your brain. So you haven't got to look away from what you're doing, but you still get all that. They'll be like, yeah, I'm well up for that. I know. They'd be the first queue and they'd pay for it. They'd actually yeah. pay for it. I mean, you keep your £10 a day that you're going to pay me, I'll give you the money. Yeah. And it's, it's yeah, it's, it's I, I, I love a conspiracy theory, though. I really do love it. Because it was also would be used as human 5G antenna as well. That's another one, isn't it? Yeah. Well, actually, a really interesting, oh, well, you decide, story about <laughs> about both COVID and conspiracy theories. So um, I was, uh, last March, so almost exactly a year ago, I'd booked tickets to go and see the Parapod. So th- there's a there was a podcast by a couple of guys, a couple of comedians, and one of them was is very much a believer, and he's very much a Barry, he's very much into believing in ghosts. And there was Ray, Ray Peacock, 
he doesn't believe he's he's the skeptic and yeah. he it was basically him mercilessly taking the piss out of uh, Barry for having these ideas and stories and you know it, they went on to conspiracy theories and stuff as well they made a film that took them years to make about four or five years and they were touring it around the country so a proper film proper feature film mm-hmm. and they one of their venues was in the story house uh, in my hometown Chester and I booked tickets for me and my wife and they rocked up it was about the 16th of March like I didn't I was like no we can't go because there were no anti-covid no distancing measures in place no one wearing masks nothing like that but it was starting to become a big thing and I was like it's really going to kill me but I don't think I should go um, yeah. So we didn't go, and it was. A, I'm still gutted because a, I wanted to see the film. B, I wanted to ask them questions. And C, one of their mates is Johnny Vegas, and he turned up, and was there and was answering questions and doing bits. So yeah, I missed out on in lots of ways. So that that's kind of it, it collided because it was it was like take they take the Mickey out of conspiracies and. I couldn't go because of a virus that loads of people think is a conspiracy. Oh, that's interesting. It's a sort of irony. It certainly is. That's going to be in the remake of the new Alanis Morissette irony song. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I get it. Yeah, no, it's one of those things. Also, Johnny Vegas. I yeah. don't get... Well, I do get Johnny Vegas, but everything about Johnny Vegas should be unlikable. He should not be a good comedian. He should not be an entertaining fellow, but there's just something about him. Yeah. There's something in dear. Now, I don't know if that's because I've spent time in the Northwest and I know what St. Helens is like (laughs) or what, but there's just something I like about him. And I can't tell whether how much of it is an act, how much of it is him, but he's, he's everything that's wrong sometimes with, with humanity, but he's got more humanity than a lot of people you see on TV at the same time. He is a complete yeah. paradox of a person. Yeah. But I can't, yeah, you can't help but like him. Yeah. Oh, he's completely bananas. I think it's just because here in the Northwest, you can only be in sort of general proximity to Wigan for a certain amount of time before it starts affecting your brain. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, and yeah, he's a very odd fella. But um, yeah, yeah, kind of like him. But there's quite, yeah, so having spent time in St. Helens, there's quite a few of him walking around in that town. Yeah, yeah it is. <laughs> Working in the bakeries and what have you. <laughs> it's, um, yeah, there's a lot of them. <laughs> yeah, there are very, there are some very odd spaces in this country and uh, yeah. parts of the Northwest definitely c- count. They sit there, they watch Johnny Vegas talking and going, why is everyone laughing? He's yeah. making a very good point, actually. <laughs> exactly, not looking in a mirror. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> I do, I, but I do like. I, I, but, so, just to clarify for anyone who is listening, but I like St Helens. I like that town. Um, I, I, I've got nothing against it, and it was just used a bit for comedic effect there. In Wigan, actually, you mentioned Wigan. There was um, a um, a place we used to go and eat there called Tay Barns, right? Which was a uh, like it's almost like a world buffet. And you go there; it's a place you go and like families of like four or more and let their kids run riot and stuff like that. Um, we went there, we took Lucas there and sort of like, we, we're always, Lucas has always been taught, like if you're at a restaurant, you sit nicely. Um, and he's always been good at it. But we, we, we took him there and kids are running around. So we were like, mate, God, go up, do what you want. He would have been, what he been like, about three at the time at Tay Barnes. Yeah. Maybe two and a half, three, three at a push. Yeah. He, so we go, go on, go get your own stuff. Have at it. Everyone else is, we're in Wigan, you know, do as the Romans do. And um, there was a couple sat there. Um, looked like it must have been a romantic date. And <laughs> they had no kids, but they was there on their own. And they looked absolutely horrified by everything that was going on around them. And I was like, <laughs> don't get me wrong. If you've gone to the Ritz and there's kids running around like that, you have every right to be disgusted and to complain. Because that's the, the ambiance of that particular restaurant. If you're going to a place called Tay Barns in Wigan that advertises itself as an all-you-can-eat buffet with every bit of food you can think of, literally it must be like, I don't think they had a set menu type thing. It was like whatever someone threw into there in the day, they, they'd put that out. 
If you're going somewhere like that, what are you expecting? Really, what are you expecting? I know, I know. And like, we're, we're the talk, like, we sort of like, no, you, like, I've, I've changed now that it's like, no, actually, let kids be kids. But I was very much, no, you've got to act in a certain way when you go to a restaurant. It's not fair on others and stuff like that. And I still believe that based on where you're going. But yeah, it's, you know, it's, just, it's just one of those things that always stuck with me and made us laugh. Sort of like watching these people absolutely horrified, almost glued to their chair because of the amount of kids running around. <laughs> Yeah, the only time I'm bothered in restaurants by kids is if they're unhappy because it makes me unhappy. Not because of the noise and, oh, I'm irritated by the noise, but because them being unhappy makes me unhappy. Like, them running around and having fun, like, makes me, you know, makes me have fun. Like, it doesn't bother me. Um, it's it's fine if you're, like you said, if you go into, a, like, a proper restaurant for a romantic meal as a couple, then you don't pick that place. You know, you pick a different place. <laughs> You know, you don't go to McDonald's to have, you know, a candlelit meal. You know what I'm saying? Whoa, whoa, whoa. Depends on how old you are. Well, if you guess. are, if you're like between 14 and yeah, 18. Yeah, 15, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, you, that's where you're going for a candlelit meal. Oh, it's great seeing us oh, going well off tangents now. But yeah, when you go into Mackey's, now, like I hardly ever go like once a year. But when you go in and you see like, a, a boy and a girl, a couple, like really awkward with each other sitting across and barely speaking, and you know that it's like their first date. That's really cute. Do you want to share chicken nuggets? <laughs> Chug it two straws for the milkshake. <laughs> Before, and the very last thing, the very last thing, back to Wigan, and we need to call this episode the Wigan Cast because yep. of this. Um, my dad always used to sing, <laughs> The Martians Have Landed in Wigan, which is a. Uh, a song by uh, the Horton Weavers, uh, the internet tells me. I uh, used to dance around the living room singing The Martians Have Landed in Wigan. So there you go. I don't know what you can do with that information, but uh, it's out there now. So. You need to find a sound bite for that. Yeah, I'll have to stick it in there. Yeah, I will do that, and I'll put it right here. Where the Martians have landed in Wigan Wigan? Of the wearing flat caps on the door <laughs> So there you go. Hopefully that isn't copyrighted, but not enough people listen to us that it should matter anyway. <laughs> or the Horton Weavers. Or the, yeah, they might do, in which case they might be happy for the promotion. You never right, know. There you, go. there you go. Right, I was going to save this for the end, but we're on tangents before I get to the eye surgery. So uh, I've, I've had a lot of time um, this past four or five days um, to think. Um, so, But I'm going to go on the tangent fact. Um, do you want some turkey facts? I have been dying to gobble them up oh, hey hey uh, i said facts not puns this is hot this is a highbrow Ooh. show highbrow thank is you it? very much yes okay it all came about because we're talking about where, where we're going to go post restrictions starting to lift you know wh- where we're going to go for our first place to eat um was we going to go to like a cafe in basildon or something like that for a fry up well no there's a place in chelmsford um called the little Caf. And it's run by a lovely family um, and their mum has been stuck out in Turkey. Um, she went out to Turkey and because of the pandemic has been out there for the best part of a year now. And just before the recent lockdown, um, we was on, like they said she was due to come back. We don't know if she ever made it back or not, or whether she's still out in Turkey. Absolutely nothing to do with anything. But if you're ever in Chelmsford, go and eat at the Little Caf. Lovely place. Anyway, um, yeah, they're from Turkey. And then it got me to thinking, because this is where how my brain goes the most of the time. But when I've got extra time, this is where my brain goes. What do they call turkeys in Turkey? It's a good question. It is a good question. Do they yeah. call them turkeys? So I asked, first I asked the um, Amazon Echo, and she just gave me some facts about Turkey and the Turkish language. Well, that's not what I wanted to know at all. So we used Google, because you can type in specifically in Google still. So again, people who are listening to this in the future, we used to use our hands type stuff to search i know amazing crazy i know and so searched it in and the name the, the name of the turkey the bird not the country uh the name of the turkey is actually a location based thing um so people in turkey refer to the turkey as a hindi because they believe it originated from india and the reason it's called a turkey and it was native to America was because when the Europeans went over to America, 
they saw this native bird, which was very similar to a guinea fowl. The guinea fowl was also known as the Turkish fowl because it was imported to the UK from Turkey. So that's why they thought they they then because it was similar to the guinea fowl in America, they thought it was a turkey fowl. So it was called a turkey in America, and that's the name that stuck pretty much most of the uh, Western world. That's that's fascinating. And the Swedes called it a cow kun. So when you lost your eyesight, mm-hmm. you also lost your mind. Is that right? Because that's how it's coming across at the moment. What? Because I looked up turkey facts. Because you're obsessed, obsessed man. Right, so this is how obsessed I am. We started, this came into my mind at about 20 to 10 this morning. What time did we start recording, Stu? <laughs> like 10 past 10. Yeah, um, but it's a long day. The, the days are long. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so I've loads of... So, let, let's get back on track. Um, Turkey Facts, yeah, they just came, so I thought I'd, I'd introduce those. It was mainly because I thought I could name, it, like, name the show something Turkey-based, but obviously we're going for Wigan-based now. So, Oh, I think we have to. These things dictate themselves, you know what I mean? Oh, yeah, 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 clearly. Um, anyway, so, Operation on My Eye. Complete success, apparently, which is good news. So I go in... Right, I was very, very nervous. Went in on the Monday and they said, like, look, you've got to do it local. We spoke about that in last week's podcast. I was like, right, okay, let, let's do it. Let's just go and do it. So I got my sedative, um, had that on the Thursday morning after really, like, could barely eat the day before because I just felt so nervous. And so I got up the next day, slept soundly, actually, bizarrely. Nights before that, the rest of the week, I was, like, awake every few moments, but slept really soundly. Got up. Felt sick, felt nervous, but got up, got showered, done it. Went straight to the, the partner took me straight to the hospital, sat down. Um, they gave me a ton, 10 ton of different drops in my eye. There was two people before me. Even though I was the first one there, there was two people in surgery before me. So I was like, ah, oh, I don't want to wait too long. The more I wait, the more nervous I'm going to get. And I was get, and then the sedative hit and I was like, ah, oh, nice and relaxed. I wonder how turkeys are doing. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> um so yeah um got got really relaxed hair net on i had blue bags on my feet because it's sterile and then they took me into the theater um we watched a nice show that's poor cut that cut that joke you didn't have to tell me twice (laughs) or leave it uh took me into theater and they be down and they're like right okay a few more drops i don't know how many drops i had in my eye building up to this but yeah loads um, a few more drops in the eye, and then they go, right, going to do the anaesthetic now. It's going to, you're going to feel pressure on the back of your eyeball. Uh, what they didn't say with it, it didn't actually hurt the um, anaesthetic, which was interesting, but they, the pressure was intense. But it felt like they was trying to pierce my eyeball with it. And I, it, the pressure on it made it feel like it's going to pop in a minute. They're going to pop the fucking eyeball. It's like, look, please stop, please stop, please stop. And then they stop. And then all of a sudden, that pain over about 20 seconds goes away and you can't feel a thing right um, yeah and then they cover your eye with like obviously like a um mati- like uh, a sheet um for obviously blood any blood or anything that goes you've seen operations on tv and the doctor says to me he goes right you're gonna hear us talking just ignore whatever we're saying and i know why they tell you to ignore whatever they're saying and i'll come to that in a second um ignore everything we're saying um and just relax you've had your sedative you'll just relax so they go in, and first of all, they set, put in like I'm assuming it's like a glorified vacuum needle into my eye. It goes, and it's like um, a really weird Middle Eastern puppet show. Um, you can see like everything clear black outlines that's going into your eye. Um, so you start sucking out the blood, and then it becomes like a, a really trippy visual show with like your blood swirling around in your eye line, and then gradually being sucked up this needle. And I'm relaxed. I just like, like, I'm really, really relaxed at this point. I'm enjoying the show. But obviously, the deeper they go into your eye and do more things, they obviously detach parts of your eye. So the light and everything you can see just slowly fades away. Um, so I had to click my fingers, make sure I wasn't dead. <laughs> yeah. Um, I was like, am I dying? Should I, should, I, should I go towards that light or what? I don't know. I wasn't dead. <laughs> <clears throat> and so the <clears throat> whole operation took you know, about an hour and a half. And they're talking away. There's obviously one senior surgeon there who's doing the main surgery and another surgeon because they always have an assistant. I'm assuming just in case something goes wrong or 
the surgeon collapses and they've got another one who can just at least finish it off or something like that. So one surgeon is doing stuff and he's calling for his different tools. Scissors isn't something you expect to be a tool. They're using eye surgery, but they use something called scissors, a diaphragm, a few other bits. And there's one I'll come to in a minute that I, I resisted actually making a joke um, because I thought it would be not well, bad taste, but either it hate me for making the joke and blind me or he'd laugh because it was funny and would blind me because he was laughing i don't know so i decided not to do it i showed restraint uh, that shows how sedated i was by the way i showed restraint and didn't talk <laughs> god yeah where can we get more of this stuff <laughs> yeah. to inject into you can we give it to brad every tuesday please <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, and um but yeah one of them uh was well, so, yeah they're talking they're, they start arguing like a married couple and he's like why are you doing that and the main guy's going i always do that and he went no i only do that if we absolutely have to so i'm like they're there even though i'm sedate going hmm that sounds good they're arguing over what they should be doing in my eye um, and there was loads of little pet like it sounded like petty arguments i'm sure it's just the way they do it every single operation um and it didn't help that the days beforehand lorraine had to tell me um like to sort of like reel it in with my ma- imagination because i was going like as, as though we'd hired a couple of cowboys to come and do the painting and decorating for us like off the street this is then what was in my mind i just went oh my god i said what if i blink while they're doing something and she's like look they're gonna have stuff to stop you blinking don't worry about it i said yeah okay but what if i try and look in a different direction if they tell me to look forward i know what i'm like because I know what I do for laser surgery. They told me not to look in the laser. I spend the whole time looking at the laser to try and avoid it. So I'm going to keep looking. And what if I look away? And they do, she's going, they're professionals. They are absolute professionals. They know what they're doing and they deal with it. It's not as if it's their first surgery. Yeah. And I'm going through, I'm like, really, in the days, but I'm going through every kind of connotation. It's like, no, I'm, I'm going to be blind. They're going to stop halfway through and go, oh, sorry, mate, we buggered it. Complete success. But they use the thing called a chandelier. They use different points of that chandelier to illuminate different points of your eye that they're working on. Okay. And he got the chandelier and the guys could have had to work it into place. And all I'm thinking, and I went, I just kind of went, I'm going to say this. Shall I say this? As he's gone, right, okay, we've got that into place. I just felt in my brain, I just went, brace yourself, Rodney. I understand. I get that reference. And I really wanted to say it. Do you know how much restraint it took for me not to say? That? I think I said about before I died, like I will make jokes at inappropriate times or when they're possibly not needed because I use it as a coping mechanism. It took so much restraint because I'm going, if I say this and it's funny, what if they slip? Yeah. And But if it's not funny, what if they just go, I'll fucking dig that in a bit harder, you twat. And I was like, I was like, but I was, I was so proud of myself. But I think I've told like everyone since, oh, this joke I came up with. And so I was like, yeah. Yeah, Lowe's heard it way too many times. But I was really proud of that one, especially as they was. I don't know if maybe they're doing it, hoping someone will say it one day because he was like, right, you ready? We're just going to put it into place. So they might be waiting for someone to say it. They could be really big. Well, if they've got like a, a drummer in the corner ready to do the then yeah. you know they probably or they said, oh, they've heard that joke so many times because it's usually the old people who are probably having that operation done. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, it was operation was done. Got a lovely cup of tea afterwards, which was nice. That's the main thing. Yeah, no, that's good. Always, always good. Um, but I'm sitting there in complete darkness. I've got a patch over my eye. Complete darkness, can't see a thing. Really disorientating. And, but then over the next few days, because they told me stuff. They told me stuff, but I didn't take it in, probably partly because I was sedated <clears throat> through the medication I had. And also, um, I, I'm a warrior and stuff anyway, so I didn't really take it all in. They mentioned something about a gas. I don't know what that meant. Um, so on the Friday, everything was still really blurry when I took the main patch off and, and fairly dark and stuff like that. The Saturday late afternoon, I started to see a bit of definition. So I could see like where I sit on the sofa, the TV's directly opposite. And I could almost work out where the edge of the TV was compared to the wall. And I said to Lo, I went, I went, oh, no, I think it's improving. I can work out, you know, basically where the edge of the TV is. And then later that evening, I was like, oh, shit, no, it's gone. It's gone blurry again. And Sunday, it was really blurry. I was like, oh, no. Oh, Christ. It's going wrong. My eyes have gone wrong. It's started to get better. Now they're getting blurry again. I was like, oh, no, 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 no. So I said, like, I've got to go back in on the Monday anyway. So I didn't want to call anyone. So I was like, I'm panicking, like, internally. I don't want to worry anyone. 
like to the surgery like felt really nervous about going to see the um surgeon uh, the surgeon again and um so it gets me in really quick actually 9 30 appointment i think i was done by 10 nice like, great i've never been that quick in a waiting room love it um so he calls me in he looks at it and he has a look and he goes all right now sit back and i went i went what's up I went to the surgery i went it's gone wrong hasn't it he went, no, it's doing exactly as we want it to do. So I went, well, why is all, all the bouncy stuff? He went, because I explained to you, <laughs> you're going to have a gas in your eye. And that gas will help like, get help get rid of the bleeding. It helps with the sort of recovery. And um, that takes about two weeks to go away, to disperse. And that's when you'll get your vision back. And we explained this to you in the post-op. Okay, did you? Yeah. And we said, remember, you've got to keep your patch on. Stuff like that. You might see some slight changes in your vision and then it'll revert back. We, we told you all this um, so to keep you calm. I'm like, okay. So it's all gone okay? It's like, yeah, it's absolutely fine. Exactly what he could like, You've not had a minor surgery. Just because you was under a local, yeah. it wasn't a minor surgery. You've had a major surgery. Major op, yeah. So you're not going to be back to your like, full after a couple of days. I was like, okay. Right, okay, that's good. So it's all gone well. It's like, yes, it's gone absolutely fine. Um, I just I was like, okay, I can relax now. So, yeah, but the days are long, especially when you've got that panic. So one of the things I had when I was, like, really depressed at, like, my lowest was I'd wake up in the morning and have that utter disappointment at waking up. Um, that, oh, crap, I haven't died in the night. And then you spend... The next however long, just basically you go through your day counting down the days, like the time till you go to sleep again in the hope that you might die through the night again. Yeah. Um, and it's that, that whole point between sleeping is just like counting down. Now, it's similar, not in the I hope I die in the middle of the night thing, but that whole I'm waking up in the morning, I can't do anything. I'm like almost completely reliant on my family. So Lucas is earning money by making me cups of coffee and stuff like that. I can't wash up. I can't dry up. I can't tidy up. And so one, I feel useless within myself. So I've got to tell myself that this is temporary. You are not useless. It is temporary. Uh, but it's how we deal with it. I've always dealt with, you know, my own pain and injuries with humor and stuff like that. My depression, I deal with it with humor because if you can't laugh at it, then it's going to take over. So, but anyway, so basically counting down the time going like I'm blind. All I can really do is sit there. Um, so just sitting there and waiting and waiting. And in that time, you either spend your time looking at certain objects in your property or you think certain objects and going like, am I seeing that better? Is that getting worse? No, it's getting better. Was it better than it was a couple of hours ago? I don't know. Right, let's remember what this looks like. Okay, now I'm back later. Okay, right, is this any better? I don't know. Can I have a cup of tea? Yeah, that's fine. Oh, coffee. I don't drink tea. Can I have a cup of coffee? Yeah, that's going to cost you 10p, Dad. That's fine. He went, yeah, so Luke is making me coffees anyway. Um, Lowe's doing my eye drops for me, bringing my insulin and my dinners. You know, I'm being weighted on hand and foot. It's not as fun as that sounds, being weighted on hand and foot. Nah. Uh, especially if you're someone who is quite independent anyway. You're like, I, I need to be helping. And realising how much I do actually do throughout the day, like when Lorraine's at work and stuff like that. And it's like, I feel completely useless. So I'm, I'm having to keep myself positive. So one of the things I'm doing is we do have the TV on. I've been listening to podcasts and the radio and, and bits and bobs and and trying to find out rubbish factoids. Um, Surely not. <laughs> and yeah, it, yeah. So it's been really hard to cope with that. It, even though to people around me, you feel lonely because it's it, you can't see anything. But you, yeah, what I am able to see is I know things are there. And again, I come to the point and <clears throat> of being. If this was the end of it, say it didn't improve any further, my eyesight, and they couldn't do anything with my left eye, I would rather have something maybe completely blind than what I am now because I can see stuff, but I can't do anything, which I feel was, would affect me more than going, right, I'm completely blind. I can't see what I'm doing, so I can get that. Plus, I'd actually be able to get the help yeah. that I needed because even though I am blind, I'm, I wouldn't be able to be registered as blind as I am at the moment, yeah, either, course. which is ridiculous. Yeah absolutely ridiculous and just yeah i feel useless now thankfully it's not making me feel depressed about myself or or anything like that what i've got to be careful is because he said to me it's a couple of weeks and your vision will start to come back i don't think that means i'm going to have perfect vision in two weeks 
and I'm having to keep my feet on the ground when it comes to that side of it. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Otherwise, I'm going to hit two weeks and go, well, I can't see perfectly. Fuck, it's all gone wrong again. Then blaming myself, what have I done wrong? Now, I did wonder whether stuff would go wrong because obviously, they first of all, they give you like a, a, an eye patch, but it's quite, it's a solid eye patch. It's not like a pirate's eye patch or anything like that. Oh, boo. Um, it's like a solid plastic. <laughs> I know, I know. It's a sonic plastic, sonic, a solid plastic shield. Um, yeah, it's boring. It's see through um, as well. But anyway, sitting in the waiting room afterwards, and I can't see a thing. So Lorraine comes and gets me. They let her come through to come and get me, and she has to guide me out. She walks me into two doors. Yeah, well, that's that's funny. So you know. <laughs> straight away, she says it was an accident. But yeah, walks me into two doors. Didn't hit my head on those ones though. Good. Um, then we, we go and pick Edith up from school. Um, but I've still got my coat on. Um, so I was able to manoeuvre myself out of the car to take my coat off, feel my way to the back of the car and put my coat on the back. But as I got in, I headbutted the car. Nice. That, that wasn't clever. But only caught the top of my head on the right side where my eye was. I didn't actually hit my eye. So, yeah, but brain damage is fine as long as I don't damage my eye. Then we get home and we sort of like, she guides me up the stairs, like into the place, up the stairs um, to the flat. She opens the door for me and starts guiding me through the door, then lets the front door go. And the front door hits me straight across the like the head where my eye is. Luckily, again, saved by this plastic shield. So, yeah, Lowe's can't be my guide dog. <laughs> but, yeah, no, what's already been a long year uh, is feeding longer at the moment because I'm just stuck in semi-darkness. But I do want to shout out Lorraine, actually. She's been wonderful. She's got a stinking cold herself at the moment. But she's been absolutely wonderful in looking after me. Um, and oh, that's better. She's taken she's taken the knife out of my neck now. Me. Oh. <laughs> At last. Uh, no, she she has. She's been absolutely wonderful. Um, and Christ knows what it would be like without her. And I will be treating her um, to some dog treats afterwards. Once I'm all better. Dog, dog treats. Lovely. <laughs> No, I've already said I'm going to treat her. I'll take her out for something nice once restrictions are lifted enough and I'll treat her to a meal, um, um, what have you, because, yeah, without her, Christ knows what I'd be like yeah. at the moment. Yes, well, you, you've got to, haven't you, rely on people in these situations and you've got to hope that you haven't been such a, a bugger to them the entire time that they'll actually not take the piss and let you fall down some steps. Yes, yes. Don't give her that idea, though, because she, she would find that funny. Oh, I think we all would. Yeah, no, letting me fall down the stairs. Yeah, there she goes. She's gone, no, because then she'd have to get me picked up at the bottom. True, true. Downside to everything. Yeah. So if my doctor, my A&E doctor's listening from two weeks ago, just to point out, see, Q movie's okay. You miserable bugger. Um, there you go. So, so if we're all done, you've got nothing to add. I'm sure we'll have more updates next week on what it's like in the, in the bleak, dark world of my blind life at the moment but yeah no thank you everyone for listening to me yeah no it's interesting to find out what it's like and how you feel all the time and it was quite interesting to find out that you know you do you get kind of paranoid and stuff about yeah. about little things because yeah you would but thankfully it should all start coming back to you fairly comparatively soon yeah and next week i'll talk about sort of like the kick up the arse it's given me over managing my diabetes and stuff like that rather than going on about it today because it has given me a massive kick up the arse cool yeah so but we'll talk about that one next week awesome so that's it for this week i think carry on staying safe as much as you can i know things start starting to feel like they're reaching the end uh in a positive way so yeah i'm holding on to that personally as well that soon hopefully i've had at least stage one of the vaccine because i haven't even had my first jab yet so i'm hoping i'm going to get that soon and then you know hopefully lockdown will be eased and the numbers will hopefully be low enough so there's a lot of hopefullys in there so at least i am feeling hopeful but uh, yeah it's also spring pretty much and the clocks are going forward and all that stuff's great so to get you through the regular day feel free to use our content to do that go on youtube and watch us there and follow us on twitter not a lot of activity on twitter at the moment but obviously it'll start ramping up again soon and also you know the website lots of reviews and feel free to follow us and pay on patreon if you can afford it and if you think we're good enough so that's probably a no or donate on coffee have a great week stay safe and take care 
and it paid all the subs to the working men's clubs, cause women reminds them of home. Hey, oh.